So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ann Harrison. I'm the Dean of the Haas School of Business. Uh, welcome to today's Dean Speaker Series. Um, as you may know, our flagship Dean Speaker Series invites preeminent business leaders to share their insights with our community. I am so excited today. I cannot tell you how excited I am to welcome two exceptional leaders who are actually members of our very own faculty. Uh, they are trailblazing women in their fields, and they're using their academic chops for the public good. Um, I'll start with Ulrike. Ulrike Manmanjier is the Edward J. and Molly Arnold Professor of Finance at Haas, and she's also a professor in the economics department. She received a PhD in business economics from Harvard University and a PhD in law from the University of Bonn. Ulrike studies economics and finance with a behavioral lens. She looks at why and how people make mistakes and why often decisions are biased and deviate from the classical economic paradigm. Her work stands out for its originality and creativity. An example is her Depression Baby paper, and it, she shows that the economic conditions that prevailed when you were younger actually influence your views on money for life. Uh, in 2013, Ulrike was awarded the prestigious Fisher Black Prize from the American Finance Association. That is given to the top finance scholar in the world every other year under the age of 40. That is the top prize in finance. All the famous names you know in finance, um, people like Fisher Black, et cetera, et cetera, uh, get those, that award. Um, she also received UC Berkeley's Distinguished Teaching Award. Last year, Ulrike was appointed to Germany's Council of Economic Experts, which is the top advisory board to the national government. Um, as part of that council, she is spending time with the heads of states of all the major European countries. The council has just in issued its annual recommendations, which we'll hear more about in a moment. Please welcome Professor Malmondier. So let me turn to Catherine. Catherine Wolfram is the Cora Jane Flood Professor of Business Administration at Haas. She's also served as our Associate Dean for Academic Affairs before she left regretfully for Washington. She also served as the Faculty Director of the Energy Institute at Haas. She's an affiliated member of ARE in the, in the College of Natural Resources. She's part of the Energy and Resource Group at UC Berkeley. And she was the Program Director for the National Bureau of Economic Research's Environment Energy Economics Program, which is a top national program uh, in the US looking at environment and energy issues. Catherine is a two-time winner of our Chide Award for Excellence in Teaching. She received a PhD in economics from MIT and a bachelor's from Harvard University. Catherine's work focuses on the economics of energy markets, energy policy, climate change, and environmental regulation. In March 2021, she was appointed as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Climate and Energy Economics in the U.S. Department of Treasury, which, as you know, is led by Haas Professor Emeritus Janet Yellen. She's currently a visiting professor at Harvard's Kennedy School. Um, welcome, Professor Wolfram. Uh, I shouldn't be saying this as a completely off the record, but they are both being recruited by top schools whose names you can only imagine. One of them is a little further down on the peninsula, and then the other schools like Harvard. I hope you're having a terrible time at Harvard. <laughs> um, so following today's discussion, we will have time for audience questions. So please think of questions that you might have. Um, I'm going to start with questions for Ulrike. Ulrike, you have a thriving academic career. You live in Berkeley, 5,600 miles from Berlin. Now, how did you get to be appointed to Germany's Council of Economic Advisors, and why did you want to do it? 
Uh, well, that's an excellent question because it started off from me writing a big op-ed uh, why no self-respecting economist should ever join the German Council of Economic Experts. <laughs> um, and the occasion was um, I'd, I'd gotten a prize from the Association of German Economists and um, was talking about policy advising and uh, complained that whenever we have a new administration come in, um, you know, I remember very much when Obama came in, next thing I know, half of my department gets emptied up because people go to Washington and now it happened again um, and under Biden. Uh, Germany doesn't have that tradition and uh, of really trying to seek out the top minds. And I feel very much that this should change. And um, next thing I know, I got a call from, uh, uh, at that time, the Chancellor under Merkel, whether I would want to join the Council of Economic Experts. And I answered, well, did you read the article? <laughs> uh, uh, but since then, people were saying, since it's a little bit differently organized, it's independent, you decide a little bit yourself, you know, who's in there and so on. If you really want to change it, be part of it. And that was the big motivation. Did you all mention? Did you all hear where she said that she got a phone call from Angela Merkel? <laughs> Her team. Her team. <laughs> okay. So, um, next question. I understand that the council is known traditionally as the council of the quote unquote five wise men, but this time around there are actually three women on the council. Uh, one of them being yourself. Now, as a woman in the male dominated field of economics and finance, uh, do you feel that you bring a different perspective to the role? Um, yeah. So I, I do think it was a big mistake take to leave out an entire agenda from this um, type of policy advising. Um, you mentioned my research on experience effects. I do think what we've lived through in our lives shapes us and we bring a different perspective to, to the table. So it's good it has changed so that the, the wise men are now also a, a lot of women. At the same time, I would want to emphasize that um, what has changed mostly is the you know, how economics has changed, much more evidence-based and so on. So I don't know whether you can really gender how we're working right now, but I'm glad it has changed. So let me uh, talk about some, another aspect of your background that's different from a lot of other economists. You are a pioneer in the area of behavioral economics and finance. How is that different from classical economics and how has that affected what you bring to this important role? Um, yeah, it's uh, quite interesting how it interacts with all sorts of economic questions. So obviously, one big topic on the table this year was inflation, not only here in the US, but also in Europe. And exactly the topic you brought up early on, how experiences, times we live through, tend to stay with us, is something that's very relevant for inflation experiences. So when inflation, you know, was scratching the two digits, the 10% realm in Germany, I was not happy. Uh, but what I kept telling policymakers, not only, let's not only think about you know, fixing it right now, but um, let's keep in mind that there might be long-run implications if we stay there too long. People get risk-adverse. They get different attitudes towards saving and investment. And there was lots of interest in, in, in hearing that. Another quick example is um, labor markets. Uh, Germany, like many countries in Europe, um, have this demographic problem um, that leads to not having enough labor force. And um, how do we now attract people into the country? How do we help people to find the type of jobs and train for the type of jobs that are future-oriented? Traditional economics says, you know, incentives, punish carrot and, or punishment. And so as a behavioral economist, I get often asked, well, what other means could we use, like um, involving peers, involving nudges, involving lowering the threshold to get being mentored about maybe changing your career? It's actually amazing how interested policy, every politician I meet, We'll start with, well, you as a behavioral economist. I didn't expect that. Uh, interesting. So uh, you as a behavioral econom <laughs> economist, you just put out your first uh, annual report on this Council of Economic Advisors. Um, this is kind of a big question, but maybe you can give us the 30-second answer on how is Germany doing overall? I'll try. Um, 
not as badly as some have um, worried about last fall, uh, in particular with the energy crisis, with the with the war in Ukraine and what's happening to um, oil prices. Uh, people are very concerned about what would happen to the German economy. We at the council were a little more optimistic. Um, lots of things were going on there um, that German industries have still lots of demand for, for their products, which I haven't quite worked through, maybe partly because of supply chain issues. German consumers were forced to, they save a lot anyhow, but they were forced to save even more during uh, the COVID crisis. And so we were predicting that that will buffer a little little bit the um, the strain of you know the economic downturn that was about to come due to the energy crisis and I think so far we are right so mildly optimistic I see so did you have specific policy recommendations that you spearheaded yeah I mean um, so on the so we always pick like uh, three four five six like main topics um, one is inflation um, they are you know the ECB decides how, how to set interest rates but we put a lot of emphasis into this theme of thinking about long-run implications if we stay up at this relatively high levels of inflation uh, we also warned uh, the German government not to be too generous with the fiscal on the fiscal side I think here in the US that didn't necessarily always go well maybe the checks that were distributed during COVID could have been fine-tuned a little bit more so we were arguing a lot for fine-tuning for fine finding those folks who really need the support on the industry side and on the consumer side. And I think we're being, we're being heard there. Um, in terms of the um, labor markets, I, I already alluded to um, us, again, having a little bit of a behavioral push to kind of lower the threshold to help people to retrain, to find career paths which are future-oriented. Um, we we going away from just punishment, stopping support, but... Um, going to the workplace, um, having a different type of mentoring in place. I think that got a, a lot of good reception. And then, of course, uh, we worked a lot on energy topics and uh, how to um, help Germany get through this period of very high prices without throwing incentives out of the window, right? So the immediate instinct of governments, of people, of politicians who want to be re-elected is, oh, let's just put a price cap at a very low level and so people can just, you know, heat their uh, places as we, at, at prices. They don't have their gas bills, their, the energy bills explode. Uh, the problem is you, you destroy incentives if you do that, right? Like if, if you don't pay more than you used to pay, then there's no incentive to save energy. And that was very urgently needed in light of the reduced supply of energy from Russia in particular. Uh, so lots of talks about how one could do that with lump sum payments and keeping the incentives up it was frustrating, but I think we prevailed. <laughs> Maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. Inflation is a really big topic in the U.S. as it is in Europe. Um, in the Eurozone, uh, inflation rates right now are four times higher than, than what the European Central Bank would like them to be. What are you proposing in order to get inflation down since you don't want to hurt incentives? Um, okay, so f first of all, there is the monetary side, right? Um, so uh, central banks react as they did and do here in the US uh, by raising uh, rates and just having a voice out there saying that it's important to keep raising interest rates to combat rising inflation. Um, I think played some role. I mean, we definitely, you know, had meetings with uh, Christine Lagarde and other people of the ECB and kind of made sure because do you remember team transitory people thinking this might like you know not last and why worry too much so so our voice was there in the mix now on the fiscal side however uh, governments want to help consumers who are dealing with these increasing prices and I, I we were I was in the chancellery on the day Germany um, uh, passed this 200 billion package to support uh, consumers and industries in Germany to get through this period of uh, energy crisis and high prices. And I literally remember them basically running a victory lap and, and, and throwing the document down and they passed it through and it's called the Doppelwurms in Germany. I, like, I don't know, like they're very proud of, of, of the thing. And, and it's great, of course, we do need support. But if you just now distribute money not thinking very much about who really needs it, you put, push this additional money into the economy, 
well, that will only, you know, stimulate prices to go, go up further because people can afford paying those, those prices. So going um, to, um, you know, this, the, the, the secretary um, in, in Treasury and also in the Economics and Climate Department and kind of discussing how important it is to be targeted, which, by the way, needs a better data infrastructure in Germany. One big thing we are, we are pushing for to find out which consumers really need the support and which are the industries which will long term survive despite the, say, twice as high as US prices um, was one thing we are very involved in. But then, I mean, just a funny little anecdote. Um, in, in December specifically, the government wanted to help people to get through the winter where the energy the bill would be really high. And they basically wanted to pay the bill for, for people who are heating with, with gas. And, and I understand the impulse. But if you say, I'm paying your December bill, then there are no incentives to save, right? Like, you know, you just heat and, and open the window at the same time, you know, the government is paying. So we des helped design a structure. I mean, it was actually not the council, but it was the commission, but one of my colleagues is on that commission, carefully designed uh, like a, a scheme where, where they said, well, we basically gonna subsidize you, but in reality, we're paying one twelfth of your past consumption. In December, still from the first kilowatt hour on, you have incentives to save. That money, you know, if, if you don't consume it, you get the money back. And so they worked and worked and convincing the politician. At some point, one, what would be the US, like person just below the, the secretary, um, kind of whose background is in law, apparently said, okay, but you know, it's so complicated. Why don't we just pay the December bill? Uh -huh. And we're like, no. <laughs> so, so, so you have to be at the right place at the right moment and say, well, remember incentives? You know, we, we went over that and then luckily it passed. <laughs> wow, that's a great story. Um, let's talk a little bit more about energy. So Germany has been able to dramatically slash its dependency on Russian gas in part because of these amazing um, policies that you're in the middle of designing, but also in part by building a new import terminal for liquid natural gas. So is this an overall sustainable strategy? Um, in the long term, I mean, renewables are the future. Uh, even, even with the completely faulty Russian plan in, in, in place, it was supposed to be a crutch to get us to a bigger role for, for renewables, like to use gas kind of to, to get there. Um, I think um, right now I've, I'm very impressed how our politicians managed to pull it off to get these LNG terminals to work at that fast pace. I, I do hope that more broadly people in Germany will take note that, you know, approval processes can be much faster <laughs> than they have been in Germany in the past and apply this also, you know, to wind energy and solar energy, which often gets kind of stuck in these like long uh, approval uh, processes. But I do think um, in general, this process of transformation to renewables is still very much what we have in mind. Wow, that's that's great to hear. And here at Berkeley, we understand what you mean by long approval processes. Um, so let me ask you, uh, this is the last question I'm going to ask you before we turn to Catherine. So even though the EU is clearly pushing the U.S. to tackle climate change, um, they're not so happy with how the U.S. is doing that. There's been pushback from Germany and the EU because we're using subsidies to promote clean energy, um, at least in President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act. Um, in fact, the two of you were, were talking about this in the green room about using subsidies as, as a tool. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Is that going to lead to a trade war? Uh, that was apparently the first reaction of our uh, Treasury Secretary. Um, he has since then clarified he is not <laughs> wanting or anticipating a trade war. Um, so um, there, there is serious concern and honestly disappointment about this distortion. Um, as, as much as everybody in Europe is super excited about the U.S. turning to green energy, trying to get you know, green hydrogen sources of energy kind of off the ground, establishing a network and also taking note that, you know, Europe should have done that long ago, right? We were into this uh, much longer than the US. And um, so now it looks as if the US might be leapfrogging um, ahead. And this is 
to be applauded. This is inspiring. This is fantastic. This is great news for you know this earth. Um, but at the same time, um, maybe in particular in Europe, where we work so hard to think about subsidizing, um, not to match, not distorting competition between the different EU um, uh, member countries, it was a huge disappointment when people read the fine print, so to speak, say, oh, um, we're going to support electric vehicles and um, electric battery production, but it has to actually, the final assembly has to be in the US, it has to be produced 80% in the US, like when, when these details kind of um, came out. So that has been a big disappointment. Um, I think the US and, uh, and Europe are trying to work and find ways to make this kind of disadvantaging of European industries uh, less severe, which I very much uh, support. I think uh, it's important to keep talking rather than throwing words like trade war um, uh, in, into the round. Um, but at the same time, you know, it comes at a moment where Europe is already grappling with a situation where in the long run, energy prices for for sure, you know, in the gas oil realm um, will be significantly higher than in the U.S., and um, that means that a lot of um, companies are thinking about leaving Europe, going to the U.S., among other places, and that's, that's very tough for Europe. And Europe has to think hard now about what are our comparative advantages, what should we support, where is it long-term sustainable, where, where could we be leaders? I personally think rather than getting in a trade war or even a subsidization war, um, I'm working closely with my French colleagues who actually, by the way, um, at least some of them are also at Berkeley. The current leader used to be at Berkeley. I still know him from Berkeley, Camille Landais. Um, the, the, my French colleagues are very much, well, if they do buy American, we do buy Euro European. And, you know, you kind of can see where that's going. I rather think we should step back and focus on where we could be leaders on and in which industries, um, whether it's knowledge work related, even car related, you know, we might leverage advantages we have and kind of think more into the future. Wow, thank you so much. So you're saying that Europe is excited that America is moving uh, aggressively on uh, on the climate change front, but as you point out, very disappointed that the form it's taking is through subsidies and not, for example, through a carbon tax. Catherine, would you like to comment on that? <laughs> Um, sure. So, I, yeah, I think at a high level, these issues of trade and how the U.S. and the EU either work together or work against one another are, are super important. Climate change is, of course, a global problem. We need to solve it as a as a global community, so we need to solve it multilaterally. And I guess I see there being kind of two paths forward. The, the, the bad path is that we get into subsidy wars. The subsidy wars, we, we don't kind of push things down a learning curve, but we end up competing for scarce resources like lithium, and then we have to subsidize even more. And ultimately, you know, along the bad path, if the EU ends up giving up on carbon pricing because the U.S. isn't doing carbon pricing, that, that would be a bad outcome. You know, the, the European Union has a cap-and-trade program that's been very effective in driving down emissions in the power and industrial sector. I, I think the good path, though, is that we figure out that we can work together and that we can actually use trade to help address climate change. So... One thing that I've been thinking a lot about lately um, is methane emissions. And it turns out that the very dirty countries in terms of methane are Turkmenistan, Iran, Iraq. We would wait forever if, if we wanted to have every country kind of decide on its own to address Climate change, Iran and Iraq are not going to be kind of high on the list to, to do it. Iran is one of the very few company, countries that is not uh, signed on to the Paris Climate Agreement. But if the U.S. and the EU can get together and say, Iran, we don't really want your oil, or you got to kind of clean up your act in terms of the methane emissions associated with your oil, otherwise we're not going to import it. That, that's a way in which we could use trade and kind of use our communal buying power to, to make some real change um, in terms of, of climate change. So, you know, I, I, I think these trade and climate issues are super, super important, and policymakers have kind of the, the bad path that they could go down, but there's also a good path, and hopefully they'll, they'll choose the latter. 
Well, let, let's just step back for a second, and maybe you could just tell us what made you to de decide to go to Washington. Sure, sure. So like um, a lot of my colleagues, I, I wanted to be relevant to policymakers, and I wanted to have my, my research influence decisions. But I figured I really should probably understand what it's like to, to be a policymaker and see how the sausage is made. So when uh, Janet Yellen was appointed as Treasury Secretary, I, I reached out to her actively. So I, I, if anyone is interested in policy, I guess I would firmly encourage you to do the same. Just don't wait for, for them to come to you. Life in D.C. is so, so hectic. They're, they're going a million miles an hour. I used to think that they would kind of scan the whole field of environmental economics and pick, like, the best person who is the exact right match. But you need to kind of raise your hand and say, I'm ready. I'd, I'd like to be there. And, you know, it's 11 p.m. at night, and the guy has the, the job of finding somebody to fill the role. If you volunteered, then it's, it's, um, it's attractive. So... Basically, there had been a position in Treasury working on environmental issues uh, during the Obama administration, not during the Trump administration. The, the environmental position got um, eradicated. But I, I reached out to her and I said, if you're interested in having that position again, I'd, I'd be happy to fill it. So it, it worked out. Wow, that's a really important lesson for all of us, being proactive, right? Not waiting for them to call you, you call them. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's great for us all to hear that. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a question back to this conversation about subsidies. Why do you think the Biden administration is so reluctant to put a price on carbon? Yeah, um, <laughs> There was a small window of opportunity, and a bunch of people said that there were 49 senators that would have been okay with a carbon price. There was a, a small window when uh, Jen Psaki from the podium said one of the one of the concerns was that Biden had made this pledge not to raise taxes on people who made less than four hundred thousand dollars a year. And so there was the question, well, if we have carbon pricing, would that be a violation of of that pledge? But Jen Psaki from the podium said, no, that, that's not a violation. Um, so there, there, was, there was some movement for it. But in the end, Senator Manchin had a lot of sway, and Senator Manchin did not like carbon pricing. So here, here we are. Thank you. Thank you for that insight. Um, so the U.S. Treasury might not sound like the obvious place to make a difference in climate policy, but it turns out that your timing was really fortuitous. So tell us a little bit about how you did that and tell us about your work on the Inflation Reduction Act. Sure. So when I started talking to Treasury, it was the end of December 2020. Uh, the Georgia elections hadn't happened yet and the war in, in Ukraine hadn't happened yet. So since I, after I started talking to them, the, the two Georgia elections went the Democrats' way, which meant that they could use what's called budget reconciliation to, to pass uh, climate legislation. Budget reconciliation basically meant that any of the climate activities had to, had to go through Treasury, had to be in the, in the tax code. So Treasury ended up playing a, a super, super important role in designing the, um, the provisions or you know, commenting for sure on, on the provisions that were in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so it was a different office. There's an office of tax policy. And since a lot of the actions were happening through the, the tax code, they were really the, the uh, ground zero or the center of the Inflation Reduction Act. And actually, I can remember, for instance, those of you that are following um, the, the discussions about green hydrogen and what counts as green hydrogen. There were people in the Office of Tax Policy saying, wait a minute, it's going to be really hard to define what green hydrogen, what counts as green hydrogen. Um, so I, I got kind of a front row seat to the Inflation Reduction Act. I can't claim that I was part of it since I wasn't in that office. The, the second thing that happened um, was the, the war in Ukraine, the invasion by Russia almost, two, almost a year ago. And there, again, you know, you wouldn't think of Treasury being central to, to thinking about energy policy, but Treasury is very important in thinking about sanctions. So uh, Treasury has an Office of Terrorism Financing and Financial Crimes. It kind of sounds like they're the office for financing terrorism, but they're against financing terrorism. Um, 
but they run, they run sanctions. They run the sanctions program. And so I got very, very involved in designing and implementing the price cap on Russian oil. And that was absolutely fascinating just to see it go from a, a memo. And I, I, I can't take credit for the idea, but I definitely take credit for writing the early memo and, you know, pushing it, pushing it hard um, through the, the actual implementation. So that was really, really fascinating to see. Tell us more how you did that. <laughs> um, I mean, I didn't. I, I I didn't do it by myself. There were definitely other people at Treasury. Um, but you do kind of see the, the the power of the personality. There was some. The head of the Office of Terrorism Financing and Financial Crimes is is a force to be reckoned with. And she, you know, she would go to her counterparts in the uh, UK and in Berlin and and just say, okay. You know, she, she's petite and, and smiles, but here's what we're going to do. And it would get done. So. And why did they agree to this price cap? Um, so one one thing about the, the price cap is, and I guess I should step back and explain a bit what it does for those of you that, that haven't followed it. Basically, the idea is to put a cap on the price that's paid to Russia for exports of, of Russian oil. And the way that's enforced is by saying that the EU companies, the, Europe, uh, the UK companies, the US companies can't insure, can't um, transport r- oil out of Russia if, it's, if the price is above the price cap. And so right now, for crude oil, the price cap is $60. It seems like it, it's kind of working. There are definitely some exports out of Russia that are above that cap, but they're not traveling on uh, Greek tankers, and they're not being insured by by UK UK companies. Um, So, you know, basically, actually, now I'm forgetting what the question was. (laughs) You were telling us how you made this happen. Uh, Yeah, how we made it happen. So one thing that's useful is that it's, um, it's a solution to kind of how so basically russia is is uh what this mclean had this phrase to describe russia russia is a petrol station masquerading as a country so russia's you know huge huge share of the government finances come from the export of natural gas and the export of oil and so Early on in the war, there was the position that we, we need to be really careful about energy markets and we don't want to sanction, for instance, banks that are actively involved in, in the energy trade. And so we were trying not to royal energy markets. But in the meantime, Russia was just minting money because the oil prices, gas prices had gone up because of this war that they had started. So it was just kind of particularly galling that they were making more money off the war that, that they had created. Uh, so the, the uh, strategy that's typically taken if there are countries that are, you know, Iran, that, that are doing things that, that the U.S. government doesn't like is an outright embargo. Let's just say we don't want anybody to be buying oil from Iran we just couldn't do that in the case of Russia. Russia is too big an oil exporter that would have driven the, the price of oil up dramatically if the U.S. had, had kind of tried to impose an embargo or, or you know, even worse, if, if a coalition of countries. And so the price cap is its kind of middle, middle ground that we can't do an embargo. We can't let Russia continue to mint money. So let's try to keep the oil coming out of Russia, but limit the revenues that, that Russia is getting. Has that happened? Has, have it, has it been effective? Yeah, that's the, that's the million dollar question. It went into, um, effect in December for crude oil. And then in February for the petroleum products, Everyone, the, the the way at Treasury we framed it was that the price cap had two goals. One goal was to reduce Russia's revenues, and the other was to keep global oil markets stable and, and not to cause a global recession because oil prices had really spiked. And so I think by those two metrics, um, it's it's going well. Russia, if if you look at the statements coming out of the Ministry of Finance there, for instance, they, they're hurting. They are talking about implementing one-off business taxes because the revenues from oil exports have gone down. So I think, you know, that's a very 
promising development and in terms of trying to limit their ability to to have money to buy tanks and and pay soldiers. And oil markets are are quite calm. So Russia made a statement last week that they were going to cut production by about 500,000 barrels a day. And we were always nervous about that at Treasury, about them reacting to the price cap by cutting production. But oil markets, they went up a little bit, but now they're back down today with the inflation print. So yeah, I, I think by those two metrics so far, it, it has been successful. Well, congratulations. So let me just step back and ask another question that's kind of off the, that path. Um, so ha- you were an academic before you went to Washington. How How is the culture different in Washington? It's, it's 180 degrees different. Um, so one thing, Anne, I think you will appreciate, you, deans are kind of the bosses of professors, but not really the bosses of professors. I was the deputy assistant secretary. The assistant secretary was my boss, and my boss would call me occasionally, not all the time, Friday night at 8 p.m., say, we want something by Saturday morning. And I had to, you know, I had to do it. So, um, you know, one thing is is the hierarchy. It's definitely hierarchical at and um, in D.C. The other thing is just the language. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's the English language, but, for instance, in D.C., <laughs> You say that um, you want to table something. In, in common parlance, that means like we're going to put that idea aside, right? In D.C., table means like put it on the table. We're moving forward with, with this. So, um, And all the acronyms, I mean, they're, they're yeah, just, uh, yeah, lot, lots, of, lots of learning, new language, new culture for sure. I like the idea of asking for something on Friday night and having it appear on my <laughs> desk on Saturday morning. Um, yes. Um, but so let me ask you a different question. So I'm I, knowing you well and knowing the amazing amount of uh, publications and research and travel all over the world you've done in energy and regulation. You have a very deep knowledge of, of the energy, um, probably deeper than many Washington policymakers. So how was your expertise received? <laughs> um, so for one thing, I'm, I was a deputy assistant secretary. It did not matter that I was a professor or I was a grad student. I, I, was, I was defined by my, my position in, in D.C. and not by you know, what I had, I had done before necessarily. That I definitely... Um, yeah, it's a little bit striking. I I would think, well, come on, I wrote a paper on that. Why are you questioning what <laughs> what I'm saying about that? But um, it, it's just it's it's the way it is the hierarchy. Um, but you know, I definitely was able to. I had connections in the economics field, and so I could call friends that I knew that you know. Can you give me an answer to this in the next four hours? That that was definitely something that was useful. So I I, I drew on my network um, certainly, but yeah, my my your standing in the academic field doesn't necessarily carry over to standing in in DC. So um, we now have the opportunity to field questions from all of you. Um, um, first, before we move to the question, uh, so I'm going to ask if you have questions to go to the mic and uh, identify yourself and then ask the question to to Ulrike or Catherine or both of them. But before we get to questions, can we just do a round of applause for these amazing women? It's just amazing to me to have three women up here uh, and doing an incredible, well, I'll exclude myself. These two women are doing amazing things. I'm just so thrilled. So uh, questions from the floor. Thank you all for being, it's kind of weird, walking all the way back just to say hi again. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. It's uh, super um, amazing to, to meet everybody here. Um, as business people, uh, my name is Julian. I'm a second year MBA full-time student. Um, as business people, policy seems sometimes to be a little bit outside of our world, um, for better or for worse. Um, there's a million questions that I, can, I can ask you guys, but maybe the question I want to ask you guys the most is, 
what is the most misunderstood thing about your job that you'd like people to understand? I, I, I'll start. So somebody said to me when I was coming in to government, they said, there's not a hidden army here. I, I guess as an academic, you think, well, this would be a good policy idea. Why isn't this being done? And I think a lot of the, the issue is that there's just not enough capacity there to do it. That There are a lot of good ideas that, yeah, they just need somebody in government to kind of take it, take the bull by the horns and, and drive it through. And if, if that doesn't happen, if there's not the right person that's really motivated to do that, it, it doesn't happen. One thing that I, you know, one of the kind of translations that I started to do was millions to billions, like a hundred million dollar program in government is tiny. That, that, yeah, that's just kind of something that is a is a nuisance that people have to deal with it. They have to deal with it. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, to, to, to chime in, um, first, quite similar. Um, I think um, what I had completely misunderstood about politics and, and policy is, um, Catherine used the word, like how the sausage is made. I kind of had this impression that there's some deep thinking and careful preparation and, and ultimately a bunch of guys get into a room and then later there's the law or an initiative and, and, and that was a little shocking. Um, but then it also showed how if you are at the right place, if you, if you can be in the room, you know, uh, you can help. You can help just by explaining things a little bit, partly very basic things. Um, but also it's often, um, you know, as you said, like motivation. It's not that people are necessarily like fiercely against or for it. If just somebody goes there and presents the thing and has the right idea ready at the right moment, it will happen. And so that aspect had really not been clear to me. And um, it is kind of motivating, again, going back to teaching. You know, sometimes I feel like, okay, we're going to teach again, like, basic incentives, like moral hazard, asymmetric information. Well, it turns out, if you can explain those well, <laughs> you can do a lot of good in the world. So I'm, like, all motivated to, you know, teach, teach folks to take all this econ knowledge with you and, and, and if, if you engage in, in policy. So, so that was another aspect I hadn't um, expected. Hello, I'm Farnam. I'm a second year PhD student at Haas. So I was wondering, how did you realize you are ready to go into that direction? Because you could have done that 10 years ago because you were already an expert, uh, an expert then. So that is my question. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, um, I'm not sure I ever felt ready. <laughs> um, so I, I, I also took note of what Catherine said earlier. You know, you just need to go out there and, like, make yourself be seen. Um, I, 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 that's a lesson I learned, although I didn't quite do it myself. I mean, people did, did call me up in the end, and I was really thinking. So, so, so the first answer is I, I didn't necessarily feel ready. But on the other hand, I was thinking when I had the opportunity and I thought about doing this and possibly changing nothing, you know, being very frustrated with like administrative hurdles or unwillingness to, to get things done. I was thinking, well, it's a little dramatic, but like from the deathbed perspective, which we like, like to assume, like, you know, would you, like looking back, don't you think you should have tried at least? And just kind of assuming this perspective of, I, at least I want to have told myself I tried, I have something to contribute, I might fail, and the probability of failure might be bigger than 50%, but I want to do it. So just getting clarity about that was key for me. Yeah, I, I don't think you're ever really ready in some ways. People talk about how the first couple months in government is like drinking from a fire hose. And to me, I, I, there was definitely that aspect, but I also felt like it, it was sometimes like running through a sprinkler, you know, one of those sprinklers that goes back and forth. And like sometimes the sprinkler was over there and I was over there. I mean, it was just, yeah, there, there, there's a lot of learning that happens when, when you get there. And I think for that reason, going kind of early um, and often, if, if you want to be part of policy, getting in, learning the language, learning the ropes, learning, you know, how the legislative branch interacts with the executive branch, learning. I, one thing I learned for sure is the power of the 
PR, public affairs, it's definitely pushed to journalists what we want them to say or, you know, what stories we want them to cover, just kind of learning all of those things that you don't get exposed to in an academic environment. I, it, I, yeah, I, I think you should go even if you think you're not ready. <laughs> Hi, thanks so much for taking the time to be here with us today. Uh, I'm Zofia. I'm a second year undergrad studying data science here at Berkeley. Mm, I'm also Polish, so the German connection is super close to sort of me and my heart and my connection to my home country. Mm, I'm also the founder of a foundation called Girls Future Eddy. So for the past five years, we've helped over 80,000 girls from Central Eastern Europe be prepared for being future ready in their future careers. So you both talk a lot about this idea of, you know, being in the room where it happens and having an impact on what's happening around the world. How do you get into that room, especially when you're a young person? You know, I'm 20. I've been working in activism since I've been four, I was 14. And there's a huge struggle when it comes to either being a woman or being a young woman specifically. What is your biggest piece of advice when it comes to getting in that room and having the influence that you're looking for? This is going to be very specific to policy, but in some ways I'm an anomaly because I, I was not involved with the campaign. I reached out to Yellen after the election had been won and after the, um, you know, af after some of the people had been seated. But I think getting involved early in the campaigns is, is really important. Also, one thing I noticed for sure is it didn't really matter which campaign you were part of. There were, there were definitely people that had high-ranking jobs that had been part of the Buttigieg or the Kamala Harris campaign. So, you know, everything gets consolidated in the general election and people that have been... It's not a matter of kind of picking the right horse. Even if you work for a different campaign, you can... Yeah, you, you can be part of the administration. So I guess maybe trying to scale up a little bit, like get involved early. Um, at, Baby at, steps is what you're trying to say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah, and I would add to that, um, um, I think it's great if you found your thing, you're motivated to work on, you care about, you want to improve in the world, and then um, do this one additional step and kind of find who in which ministry kind of is working on these topics. And you don't, you know, you don't have to start with the secretary and talk to him <laughs> or her right away. You know, you might find some kind of groups um, which is kind of working around this theme and we reach out to them. And there's a lot of interest in people, I mean, who are informed, not kind of coming up with random opinions based on like newspaper articles. I mean, there's a lot of that <laughs> as well. Um, so we are maybe a little specific in kind of coming from, you know, academia and having this whole academic career and like having the expert status uh, right away. But there's so much hunger for people who have concrete ideas and tips and like putting in the work of trying to get to that person. Like imagine, you know, Kathleen looking for like some answer within four hours or so. Once you've established the connection to her, she might come to you when she needs this answer um, quickly. Mm -hmm. So that's something which I feel for too long I didn't realize, um, you know, that I could provide my knowledge that way. And I re regret that, that I wasn't seeking out more earlier. Totally. Thanks, ladies, so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Adriana Penuela, part of the Inner Weekend MBA. And I have a question on a topic specifically to the carbon quantitative easing. So in the topic of carbon quantitative easing as a method to like uh, gain money for decarbonizing the world, what are your thoughts as policymakers and as academics on, on that specific topic? Um, so if I heard the question correctly, you were talking about uh, the policy of, of quantitative easing, which was implemented during the time with or different from now when the kind of inflation rate was was very low and kind of kind of, uh, was a very successful way of get for both in the US and in Europe of getting through this period of, of low inflation um, the big I don't know what you mean with what we are taught about it but um, yeah, so, right now it's yeah. obviously not what we want we want tightening <laughs> uh -huh. yeah specifically to carbon so like uh, the definition is an unconventional monetary policy that is featured as a proposed international climate policy uh, called global carbon rewards. So like a global, a carbon money <laughs> in order to create uh, some easing with a future view. So I don't know if you have come across this, but it is I around. Have you? 
No, I haven't. Yeah, I'm curious to follow up with you to learn more about it. Hi, thank you so much for being here today and speaking with us. It's been highly informative. So I'm Cleo. I'm a senior in Berkeley Haas, and <clears throat> I lived in Germany when Trump was president and um, when Merkel was the ch chancellor. So the politics were highly different. It was very interesting to learn about the different perspectives. Um, Professor Robindier, can you please talk about how on a cultural perspective or maybe in terms of policy differences, how the German economic responses to inflation and um, the Ukrainian war the past couple years have been have perhaps differed for, from what you've noticed in the United States, and can you could you elaborate on those nuances? Um, so the reactions to um, the increasing inflation rates and the Ukrainian war are actually much less different than I you know the time when you lived in Germany. The differences between German politics and U.S. politics um, at that time. So I'm kind of that's a good thing for the U.S. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm actually happy that we are converging <laughs> somewhat. Um, it's, um, yeah, I mean, just to kind of compare a little bit um, the U.S. and the Europe perspective on those two things, however. So, I mean, for starters, on the inflation side, uh, we have uh, in Europe, we have the ECB. Monetary policy is made at, at the EU level, it's decided at the EU level. And then you have all these member countries who may do all sorts of stuff on their fiscal policy side, which may or may not be consistent with the monetary policy and may or may not make the life of Christine Lagarde uh, harder or, or easier. So that's an interesting uh, difference. Um, it, is, it has been particularly interesting to see in, on the inflation side how, you know, the US was some months ahead and with inflation increasing and possibly reacted a little bit too slowly and kind of reacting to that. And uh, Europe had the benefit of kind of watching that and like being behind. And so you would have thought they're on it right away, but they completely followed the US example and like waited for my taste a couple of months too long before kind of they jumped on, all right, that's a problem uh, we have to deal with. But um, yeah, the main difference is kind of this, um, you know, ECB has a um, doesn't have the dual goal of the Fed here, which has to care about both inflation and about the, you know, output gap, the labor markets kind of side. It's only about stability of money. And nevertheless, of course, it has to be in the back of the mind of the ECB president that she doesn't want to kill the economy, which is Anne asked me about already not like in the best shape ever without declaring it an official goal. And then also how to make sure that the European Monetary Union doesn't break apart if we do something very drastic. You know, right. many of us worry about the high debt quotas of certain countries in the US, in the EU. And so um, how, do, how, do, how do you factor that in? Um, on the uh, Ukraine war, um, I have been um, mostly fascinated uh, by um, the different uh, discussion in, in, in the public. So, for example, um, I don't know whether some of you followed that on, on Twitter. There was like this whole group of macroeconomists, German macroeconomists, but also other ones who were like strongly arguing for an embargo uh, against the Russian gas, like a complete uh, embargo. And the public debate revolved all around that and people were super interested in that and back and forth with, with wow. different argument and so how how much people would get into the nitty-gritty of that was it was a striking contrast um, also we mentioned the IRA um, you know as in, in my role I, I I get invited to to talk shows a lot and so there might be some you know 10 p.m or 11 p.m talk show and you know, the, the, the secretary, of, the treasury secretary might be there and send somebody of the opposition and some journalists and me. And apparently people switch on the TV and would like to hear about the nitty gritty about which batteries are subsidized or not and us discussing about that. Very different culture. So that's kind of, as I'm flying back and forth, uh, that fascinates me a lot. <laughs> that's super interesting. Thank you. And thank you both so much. Hi thank, <clears throat> hi, thank you very much, much for being here today. Um, myself and many of my classmates as MBAs are probably going to be mostly engaging with policy from the private sector side. And in the United States, there's definitely a understanding or at least a, a preconception that most businesses get their foot in the door through political contributions. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how we might better engage with the, the policy side, uh, both responsibly and effectively. Yeah, I mean, we've been talking a lot about the Inflation Reduction Act, and there are explicit calls for comments, and the companies are, are submitting comments, so that's definitely 
one approach. We also had a number, I mean, for instance, working on the price cap in, on Russian oil, we had a number of conversations with business leaders, with people in the insurance industry, just to try to figure out like how the industry works and how they might react to this novel um, novel policy approach. I think a lot of those ended up being organized through lobbyists. So, yeah, that, that kind of having somebody on the ground in D.C. who has their ear to the ground and knows, you know, the week that we're talking about something that, that's relevant to that, to your company's interest, that, that does seem important. I mean, in, in DC timing is, is everything. If I have think, thought about this from the perspective as an academic, but it just, I, I now know that if you put out a paper in the week that people are talking about abortion and your paper is about climate, it, it, it's not going to land. If you put it out in the week, then people are talking about climate, then you'll, you'll, you'll get traction. So Definitely having somebody on the ground that that knows the week that they're talking about the the issue that's relevant to your company seems important. Um, and I would also want to add to that. That's of course more the the German perspective, which I, I don't know exactly how things are, you know work, work in Washington. Um, you having that. You know that that being on your mind is a really good thing, and like you asking like what processes, what mechanisms could be changed to make sure that we're not having politicians be influenced too much by certain perspectives from the business or the anti business side. I think is a really good thing. So I found sometimes things kind of fall into place, and that's the way we do think. I remember when um, when I was still thinking about whether or not to accept this 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 uh, position and the. Um, Secretary of Economic and Economics and Climate, Robert Habeck, called me up. And I was talking about this, this theme we had today, that I think it's important for good economists to be in the room and that I regret that Germany hasn't implemented this more uh, uh, broadly. Um, he was saying, yes, indeed. So every week I'm talking to my uh, DAX CEOs and they're talking about, you know, that they have to leave Germany, it's all too expensive, and, and, and like explain what the issues are. And I'm learning a lot, but I'm always wondering why are there not my, any of my my economist in the room or some economists in the room who have like, were not necessarily captured by one side or the other side. And um, so not sure he has changed this, but I think there's at least discussion about changing, like who should be in the room of, of these discussions, who might be able to provide a counterpoint. And so people like you, your generation going out and trying to, to change the mechanism would be a really great thing. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question. Hi, uh, thank you both for being here. My name is Paul Love. I'm a senior at the undergraduate business school. Um, what I found very interesting in the talk was kind of this discussion on the, you know, somewhat like the distortion of incentives. Uh, the example in Germany being, you know, you, you open your window and you put the heater on full blast as the, if the government's going to cover your energy bill. Um, I guess just sort of drawing on that, you know, belief and it's almost that core tenet of behavioral economics, when you think about policy making, uh, perhaps in other aspects, you know, whether that be in Germany or whether that be in the U.S., how much of a factor almost is that? And is there some concern that we're perhaps going down this road where, um, you know, at times it, it can feel like the electorate feels like that they can vote themselves uh, all of the dollars. And, you know, there's almost this culture of of excess and, you know, o overspending in some sense. So just curious from both of your perspectives, I guess, how much is this uh, thought of as a concern in, in policy making? Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's, um, it's interesting that, um, so one aspect I picked up from what you said is the kind of intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation part. So like you're doing what's in your incentive, you vote for it, you, you go for it. And on the other hand, you might do things because it's your value and you care about it. And uh, in fact, in behavioral economics, there's a debate whether extrinsic motivation can sometimes kill intrinsic uh, motivation. And um, a lot of politicians think about that. Um, I, I mentioned Robert <laughs> Habeck, and one of the first conversations I had with them was discussing with him a paper in an Israeli childcare where they showed that extrinsic motivation, and he, he loves that paper and has cited instance. And so there's a lot of thinking about it, but um, what I do want to avoid is that we contrast one with the other. 
So sure, we might, you know, keep the window closed and, and, and not have the heater on and the window open because we say, this is the moment we have to get through the winter. We're going to show it to Russia that we can do that and, and, and so on. And so intrinsic motivation is great. That doesn't mean that financial incentives help too and that people will, you know, elect um, politicians that will represent their incentives. They're both at work and just ignoring one versus the other um, um, is, is a mistake. Um, so that's one lesson I, I'm, yeah, I've learned and I'm trying to communicate. You have the last word, okay. Catherine. Um, so the, the way I experienced that was through gas prices. People are very, very focused on gas prices in the administration. Ron Klain would tweet about gas prices daily, practically. And it did kind of strike me, is, is this self-fulfilling? Are, are, is the fact that the administration is devoting so much attention to gas prices part of why everyone's focused on gas prices? I don't know the answer to that question, but yeah, I do, I do think it's a good, a good question. You know, how much is politics reactive and how much is politics driving the, the conversation, really? Well, on that note, we are so, so lucky to have these two luminaries here today. Let's give them an incredible round of applause.